Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Death at 710. Yes, we have that crime club book for you. Come right over. <laughs> Take the easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The book is on this shelf. Here it is. Death at 710 by H.F.S. Moore. The very intriguing story of a beautiful woman who was in love with death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. The train was due to leave at 710 in the evening. And at exactly eight minutes after seven, Mark Kent, a well-known mystery writer, was in drawing room B his own drawing room, when the door opened. And he was surprised to see a young, beautiful woman. He was even more surprised at the way she giggled. <laughs> Hello. Hello yourself and see how you like it. My name is Susan Ward Steele. Well, I'm flattered, but haven't you made a mistake? You're Mark Kent, the mystery writer. <laughs> I adore mystery writers. Mm. Mm. <laughs> well... Your pictures don't do you justice. <sighs> How about getting me a drink? Uh, don't you think you've had enough? Oh, be a good boy and get me a drink. I better get you back to your compartment. <sighs> I'm going to Reno. A long trip. I saw you come on the train. I knew it was going to be interesting. <laughs> I'm not going to Reno. <laughs> you should have seen Gerald's face this morning when I said goodbye to him. He's my husband. Mm. Such a Oh, uh, look, Susan, do you mind... And you should have seen Claire Ellis's face when I told her that I was going to marry Pierce Carlton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my stepbrother, Robert Ward's face, when I wouldn't let him have the money. Mm -hmm. So many faces, and all so long. <laughs> Will you do me a favor, please? Mm -hmm. Oh, Pierce will marry me. You just watch, Mark. In six weeks, when I come back from Weno... <laughs> He'll never tell me again he's not the marrying kind. Yeah, yeah. How about that drink you promised me? I didn't, Susan. I want a drink. I've got to have a drink. Uh, later, please. Anything. Water. Just uh, Take it easy, kid. Take it. I've never been so thirsty. Please. Water. Ginger ale. On the bound Chicago and points with Susan. all the uh, stuff. All the boys. No, no. Conductor, conductor, hold the train. There's a dead woman on board. Four days later, Mark Kent was in a room at police headquarters with Captain McNair, his friend. They were comparing notes, the results of intensive investigation, and some speculation. <laughs> We start with the atropine, Cap. That's what killed her. Yeah, one pill. That's usually enough. Now, here's what the book says about atropine. Huh. An organic alkaloid which causes death in humans without coarse anatomical change. No pain. That's right. Uh, symptoms include dryness of mouth and throat, giddiness, wild talk. Huh. Huh. Death usually takes place within eight hours. The coroner told me there's no set rule about that. It can happen in six hours, in four hours, in one hour. Mm -hmm. It can happen in ten hours. Well, we know from what Gerald Steele told us, Susan didn't get up until almost 11 o'clock. Yeah. Cap, are you willing to do some speculating? If it doesn't mess up the facts. What facts? All right, go ahead. But remember... You're not writing a book. This was a real murder, and I'm a real policeman. Now, we've got a pretty good idea of the kind of man Gerald Steele is. There's no record that he ever had a job. His wife, Susan, was very rich. So? Okay. We know that she left a will giving him half her estate, mm. and we know that she was going to Reno to get a divorce. Another man, Pierce Carlton. Mm. Now, let's combine what Gerald told us about that morning four days ago and what, for reasons of uh, self-preservation, he might have forgotten to tell us. Go ahead. I'm listening. All right. It's 11 o'clock. Susan Ward Steele has just gotten out of bed, and after the usual routine, she goes into the kitchen where she finds her husband sitting before a big breakfast. She's a little annoyed. Good morning, Joe. Enjoying yourself? Any objections to my being hungry? Oh, no. I thought today you might have less of an appetite. I'm not responsible for today, Susan. Ham, eggs, toast, and coffee. Is that your first helping, dear? Oh, nuts. You don't say. You're so articulate. 
Where's Tommaso? I told him to take the day off. You told him? Yes. What's the matter with that? But, darling, you don't pay his salary. I had an idea that we wouldn't want any strangers around the house today. You're so sweet. But I'm not spending today with you. Oh? I'm having lunch with Robert, tea with Claire Ellis, and then... Mm, would you like to guess? Cocktails with Pierce Carlton, the great send-off. Don't be so bitter. He works for a living. Sure. Well, at least he has an office. Pour me some coffee, please. Yes. You want eggs, too? No. Just black coffee without sugar. A full cup. You must have had a big night. Where'd Pierce take you? Places. Lots of people. I heard you slept well last night. Susan. You were snoring when I came in. Oh, for pity's sakes. First I get it because I'm eating. Now it's because I slept. <laughs> you don't think much of me. You're a parasite, Gerald. And you're beginning to look like one. You don't care what you say, do you? Oh, don't tell me that there's pride under that expanding waistline. Just one more word out of you and I'll... Yes? <sighs> What's the use? I can't take it. I don't want you to go. Really? I'm thrilled. If you go through with the divorce, I don't know what I'll do. I know one thing you'll have to do. Get a job. Huh? Let me spell it for you. J-O-B. It's what people do for money. What'd you ever do for yours? Oh, smart. I picked a family with a rich uncle. Sure, you can talk. You inherit a million dollars. You're smart. Well, let me tell you one thing, Susan. If Don't you th bother, honey. I've got something much more important to tell you. I'm not leaving you any money to live on. What? And I'm changing my will. I see. The half of my estate that you've been praying for will go to Pierce Carlton. If I should die. When do you perform the operation? After Pierce and I are married. In the meantime, if I should get hit by a truck... Yeah? Oh, darling, don't wish so hard. I'm really being very loyal to you. Yeah. Oh, well. What time is your lunch date with Robert? One o'clock. Good heavens, look at the time. I'll have to hurry. It takes me an hour to get my hair put up. Do you want some more coffee? Oh, I'd love it, but I can't spare a minute. Why didn't you tell me it was so late? It's your appointment, Angel. You, you, should, uh, you don't want another cup? Oh, dear. I really need it. All right. Bring it in the bedroom. No cream or sugar. Yes, ma'am. Anything you say, ma'am. I aim to please. There it is, Captain. Gerald Steele had motive and opportunity. You're only guessing, Mark. Well, the will's on file, isn't it? We got the story of the second cup of coffee from Gerald himself. Yeah, but the rest of the stuff, about the argument, about her changing the will. Pure speculation. The deductions of a mystery book writer. Mm. Now, what about Robert Ward, the stepbrother? He's about 15 years older than Susan, businessman. How's business? Well, we got a report from several banks that he's been trying to borrow money. They all turned him down. Uh-huh, that makes him an interesting suspect. Now, let's combine fact and fiction again and see what happened at lunch. Robert Ward told us that he'd reserved a private dining room for the occasion at the Swank Cafe Aurelia. Susan was very cheerful all through lunch. What time is your train, Susan? 7.10. Oh, it's only half past two now. I'm meeting Claire Ellis at three o'clock. Tea and gossip at her apartment. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have eaten so much. Susan. Yes, Robert. I've been waiting very patiently. What do you mean? You didn't ask me here to a private dining room to discuss my unimportant life. You're very clever. Thanks, darling. Now, what is it that you don't want your servants to overhear? I, uh, I need money. You? I know it comes as a shock, but the truth is I've, uh... How much, Robert? A hundred thousand dollars. Really? Of course, it'll be a loan, Susan. I'll pay it back in due time. I'll give you a note or a mortgage, whatever you like. Business is bad. And... I've had a very serious setback. My entire output of washing machine motors is defective. Oh, my. What's the poor housewife going to do? We know what's wrong, and we can correct it easily enough, but naturally, it can't be done without money. Naturally. I've never been without cash before, but I expanded recently, and that took all my liquid assets. <laughs> Even when you're in trouble, you talk like a bank statement. When did this delightful thing happen? Two weeks ago. Why didn't you come to me right away? Well, I didn't want to bother you. I'm a businessman, and naturally, my first call was at the banks. Naturally. Did they turn you down? They didn't consider me a good risk. Overexpansion. Oh, darling, you're as skinny as a toothpick. Susan, please don't be facetious. I'm in serious trouble. Oh. If I don't get that merchandise out of my factory, I'll go bankrupt. I won't even be able to pay my creditors. 
A hundred thousand dollars. Yes, it shouldn't mean anything to you. You can spare it. Oh, I can spare it. But tell me, Robert, dear, when did you ever do anything for me? Now, don't refuse me. You preached, called me a fool for not putting my money into a good, sound business. A wild, empty-headed fool. I tried to make you realize your responsibilities. Uncle Jeffrey left his money to us in good faith. It was our duty to protect it. I still got mine. And I've got mine in factories, machinery, and merchandise. Now I'm asking you to help me liquidate it. No. Good Lord, Susan, how can you be so heartless? I've been practicing. But... Very well. I'm not going to beg you. Don't give up hope, dear. I've taken care of you in my will. Thanks to Uncle Jeffrey, you have no choice. Half of your estate must go to me. And half of your estate should go to me. But where is it? You can look for it after I'm dead. Oh, what in the name of thunder did I do with those things? What things? My pills, my box of pickup pills. Oh, here it is, my vest pocket. So you've come to that, hmm? Just these last two weeks, doctor's prescription. I've been living in the devil's own basement, tired and depressed. What do they do for you? They give me a pickup, that's all. Get the tired feeling out of my system, clear my head. Perfectly harmless. Hmm, sounds interesting. Would you like one? Why not? I had a big night, and I've got a bigger day ahead of me. <laughs> One pill will keep you going for hours. Flip it into the back of your mouth and wash it down with water. After you, darling. Very well. I never take chances. Well, here's to you. Uh, how soon before it starts functioning? Very soon. And now I think we ought to go, Susan. I don't want you to be late for your appointment with Claire Ellis. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a possibility, Cat. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. So is a trip to the moon. Uh, uh, you better stick to writing mystery books, Mark. If you make a mistake, nobody burns, except maybe your publisher. Did Robert Ward take a pickup pill while you were grilling him three days ago? Now, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me he had a box full of atropine pills when he met Susan Steele? Maybe. And that he passed them off as pickup pills? Maybe. But according to your own speculation, he took one of those pills himself. Now, why didn't it kill him? You might have had one in that box that was harmless. Huh? You know, a real pickup pill. Sure, sure. Put that in your next bookmark. It'll read fine. I will. But for the time being, you won't mind if I keep it a secret from the district attorney, will you? No, no, I don't mind. <laughs> Shall we go on? Go ahead. I'm on 24-hour duty. Well, the next stop that Susan Steele made was Claire Ellis's apartment. Now, what do we know about Claire? She served tea and ice cream cake. But not because she liked Susan. Oh, you've got a private line to her inner thoughts, huh? Didn't you notice how she was defending Pierce Carlton as um, you were questioning her? I noticed it. Yeah, he's the man Susan Steele expects to marry. And Claire's in love with him. Hmm. Now let's see what we can get out of the situation in which two women in love with the same man meet for tea a few hours before one of them dies on a train, the victim of murder by slow poison. I'll get the tea things, Susan. They're in the kitchen. Oh, there's no rush, Claire. I'm not meeting Pierce until five. The lovely romantic orchid room. <laughs> I told this week, boy, I must have orchids on our wedding day. Slews and slews of them. <laughs> Susan, you know why I asked you here? Of course. To plead with me. We used to be good friends. Used to be? I'm sorry to hear that, honey. Susan, don't marry Pierce Carlton. <laughs> He doesn't love you, Susan. <laughs> Pierce and I were practically engaged when I introduced him to you. Why did you make a play for him? You had a husband. I was smitten. You were smitten. Believe me, darling, I've been living in a delayed paradise for three whole months. You've never loved anyone but yourself, and the only reason you went after Pierce was because he was mine. He was a conquest. Does it make any difference? You'll never be able to keep him, Susan. <laughs> Pierce is in some kind of trouble. You have money. Did he tell you all about it? Uh... Well, he told me. Doesn't that prove something? Well, what is it, Susan? What's wrong with Pierce? It's confidential, dear. Between sweethearts. I'll get the tea if you still want it. Oh, I want it. I'm a glutton for punishment. I hope you won't have to take much more of it. Ever. Why not? Hello, and don't keep me waiting. Oh, it's you. Of course, Gerald. Are you surprised to hear I'm still breathing? Where's Claire? 
Oh, she's downstairs sweeping the sidewalk. She pays off the back rent that way. I'd like to talk to her, please. Oh, she can't be disturbed. Now look here, Susan. But I can give her a message. Ask her to call me back. No love and kisses? Not yet. I was only thinking we might go for a walk in the park. A walk? How thrilling. Gerald, darling, when did you give up driving? Oh, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> You might have held that phone for me, Susan. Who called? Pierce. He simply had to tell me how much he loved me. Claire, dear, watch your manners. Trays were meant to be put down, not dropped. I'm sorry. And those exquisite ice cream cakes. You almost ruined them. That one's for you, Susan. Thanks, dear, for remembering that I adore blueberries. I never forget a lot of things. Motive and opportunity. Love and ice cream cake. Hey, Mark? Well, that's how it looks on paper, Cap. You think Claire Ellis buried the atropine in the cake? Oh, she did. She's darn clever. But uh, I don't know anybody who chews ice cream. If she did. Now, how do you figure out the business about that phone call? Well, Claire Ellis told us that Susan had received a call from Pierce. Go on. Pierce denied it. But Gerald admitted that he phoned Claire and spoke to Susan. Hmm? Claire didn't know about the call, therefore Susan told her it was from Pierce Carlton. Q-E-D. Whoops, not yet, Cap. We've still got to prove a murderer. Now, what about Pierce Carlton? He's in the stock brokerage business with his father. Good, solid family background, old stock. Mm, that doesn't keep him from being a playboy, does it? I'm not interested in what he does, Mark, only in what he did four days ago. And in what he did before that. That goes without saying, my boys are checking. I think they're going to find that he's in a mess. A money mess. Anything's possible with you around. Okay. What happened the day we spoke to Claire Ellis? Your eyes popped. You saw a beautiful woman. Could be, but she was upset. Every time you mentioned Pierce Carlton, she had jitters. Why? Somebody told me she's in love with the guy. I told you, Cap. I oh, did. sure, I knew I couldn't have gotten it from the facts. She kept saying over and over that Pierce was innocent. He had no reason for killing Susan. Cap, that girl knows something. So does everybody else in this case, except me. About Pierce Carlton, I mean. And I'm sure she didn't know it the day Susan was killed. Who told her? I don't know. What? Mark, did I hear right? Did you say you don't know? Uh, let's, uh, let's go on to item number four. Susan and Pierce at the orchid room. Dinner before train time. Soft lights, orchids on the table. A perfect setting for romance. Oh, darling, darling. Six weeks... Six long weeks without you. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Don't laugh at me, please. I'm going to miss you terribly. There's a lot of excitement in Reno. And cowboys. Pierce, how can you say that to me? Don't you like cowboys? I like you better. How was Gerald this morning? Oh, I talk about him. Why not? He's human. What's the matter with you? You'd rather talk about everyone but us. <laughs> it's a wonder you don't ask me about Claire. You know, I saw her this afternoon, too. Or don't you have to ask me about her? You never could take kidding, could you? Oh, I didn't realize. Pierce will be married just as soon as I can get back from Reno. Have some more wine, Susan. You'll be waiting for me at the station. I don't want to come back to New York and be alone for a minute. Suppose I'm not waiting. But you've got to be. Why? Because I'm depending on you. I'm going through a divorce for you. For me? I thought it was because Gerald ate too much. Pierce, would this come under the head of what you call kidding? Put your head on my shoulder and I'll, uh, I'll tell you a secret. I'd rather look you straight in the eye. I've been doing a lot of thinking. Yes? I've come to the conclusion that Gerald is a nice guy. What does that mean? You ought to stick with him. You know, till death do you part. You didn't think so last night. I wasn't thinking last night, honey. <sighs> the whole process started this afternoon. I woke up and there was a vision of a wedding bell. It scared the wits out of me. You're out of luck, Pierce. I'm not letting you out of your promise. Look, Susan, be sensible. Marriage and I were never meant for each other. I'm just not the marrying kind. No? Put your head on my shoulder and I'll tell you a secret. I'd rather just keep sitting beside you. Do you remember a certain crying jag that you had on a couple of weeks ago? Susan, I've never been drunk in my life. You were that night. And you told me a whole lot of things that you're going to regret in just about a minute. Suppose you tell them right back to me now. You lost a lot of money on a gambling boat before I met you. Huh? You paid off in IOUs. And when the gambler got tired of waiting for the cash, he threatened to see Papa. 
That's when you became a thief. Good Lord, Susan, what are you talking about? You took bonds out of your father's safe. He's got so many of them, you were sure they'd never be missed. I told you that? Your conscience was bothering you. <laughs> Bet you didn't know you had one. It's a sense you haven't. No, dear. I might really like meeting your father, telling him about those bonds. Eh? Yeah. I'm so glad you'll be waiting for me when I get back from Reno. Yeah. Come to think of it, not every woman wants to marry a thief. Oh, I'm lucky, huh? All right, let's celebrate with a drink. Friends? What else? You hold all the aces. <laughs> then we'll drink to that. Oh, no. Don't waste it that way. What's wrong? Let's lock arms. Then I'll drink out of your glass and you'll drink out of mine. Why, of course. Just like real sweethearts. Yes, dear. There's nothing like good old sparkling burgundy for launching a new life. Properly. There it is, Cap. The last episode. And you finish it with the old switch trick. The atropine pill in Pierce Carlton's glass. <laughs> I'm surprised at your mark. It's corny. Well, it happens to be true. Poison or no poison. Found out about it only this afternoon. You don't say. Who told you? The waiter in the orchid room. He saw them lock arms. And he remembered for ten bucks. What? You give me the name of that guy. I'll have him brought in here and easy, I'll book him. Cap, easy. Oh. Hello, Captain McNair talking. Homicide. That's all right, Finley. Go ahead. Uh, what? Are you sure? Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, check in at headquarters and file a report. I'll take care of the rest. What uh, sign of the horoscope were you born under, Mark? I don't know. Why? Well, you're either very smart or very lucky. Pierce Carlton lost $80,000 on Jimmy Bryson's gambling boat four months ago. Uh-huh. Uh, Finley just got it from Bryson himself. The uh, debt's been paid. That's how it is, Cap. When you go by character, you can't go wrong. Maybe I ought to have a little more respect for you, huh? Well, I'll just read my books and I'll be happy. Yeah. Now, let's see. We've got four suspects. A Gerald Steele, the husband, who was going to be left holding the empty bag. And who was still in the will for half of the fortune. Right. Mm-hmm. Robert Ward, the stepbrother who needed money and was turned down. He's in the will for the other half. My money's on him. Uh, maybe. Claire Ellis, the lovesick rival, and Pierce Carlton, who didn't want to get married but who talked too much to Susan. Every one of them had motive and opportunity. What does your imagination advise us to do now? Uh, I got an idea, Captain. Hmm? Can you get me a sample of Susan Steele's handwriting? Yeah, her signature's on her will. I've yeah. got a copy of it over there in the case file. All right, let's get the best handwriting man you've got, and then you and I will go to work catching a murderer. Mm-hmm. Does your imagination tell you where? Oh, of course. At my apartment. Mark, if this works, I'll buy you a new hat, mm. and I'll eat your old one. And, uh, I'm supposed to be all alone, Cat. Uh, Gerald Steele? Yes? Uh, this is Mark Kent. Are you free to talk? What kind of a question is that? You'll understand. I was the last one to see your wife alive. So I read in the papers. You're also a friend of the police. <laughs> Only when it's convenient. For example, I didn't tell them that Susan gave me a note before she died. A what? Uh, there's a name in it, a murderer's name. Look here, Ken, what's that got to do with me? It's for sale, Gerald. I had nothing to do with Susan's death. Oh, of course, but who's going to believe it? Does that note give my name? Is is that what Susan's done to me? I'll be in my apartment until 7.10, Gerald. Uh, you're going to inherit a lot of money. I'm sure you'll want a partner to help you enjoy it. you certainly got your nerve with you, Mark. I've also got you for protection, Cap. Now we'll just do a repeat performance on Robert Ward. And uh, then we'll uh, go down the line, Claire Ellis and Pierce Carlton. One of them's liable to bite. Stay in that other room, Cap, and don't wait for gunfire. Don't worry about me, kid. Mm. Yes, yes, I heard you the first time. Hello, Miss Ellis. Come right in. Uh, would you mind if I called you Claire? I want that letter, Mr. Kent. Uh, you wouldn't mind. And I thought this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. All I want from you is that letter. I've got a gun in my handbag, and I'm not afraid to use it. I didn't think you would be. How much money did you bring? I didn't bring any. Well, Mr. Kent? I've got the answer, lady, oh. and I'll take the handbag, too. I didn't kill Susan. Now, please, give me a chance to explain. Sure, sure. Come on. No, no. Pierce told Susan that he wasn't going to marry her. 
And I know she put his name on that letter. You don't have to protect that guy anymore. He told me the whole story the day after Susan died about her threat and why she threatened him. I made him tell me. Yeah, let's go. No, 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 please. Hmm? Somebody yeah. wants to come in here, Cam. No, another one? Uh, here's a magazine. Take Claire into that other room and read the advertisements to him. Yeah, come on, you. When that guy works in a case, you never know what's going to pop next. Coming. Oh. Get out of my way, Kent. Uh, <clears throat> with pleasure, but I'd be glad to do it, even if you didn't have a gun. Mr. Ward? Are you alone? Uh, now that you're here, practically. I don't trust you. Put up your hands and walk toward that other room. Oh, you're kidding, aren't you? Move along. I'm not going to waste any time on you. All right, but since when do blackmailers work with an audience? Just walk directly in front of me and into that room. I'm in. <laughs> you're a bigger fool than I thought, Mr. Kent. You should have protected yourself with a lie. Well, we, uh... All make mistakes, Mr. Warren. You've made your last one. I'm going to kill you. Don't you want that letter? I'll find it later, or I'll burn your apartment out of existence. I've got a right to my share of Susan's estate, and the law won't take it away from me now. So it was you who killed her? Of course. I needed money for my business, and she refused to lend it to me, the fool. No intelligence, as she'd have known I was prepared for every emergency. Yes, I saw it. I've had that figured out. This box of pills. Pickup pills. Mm. A wonderful tonic. Unfortunately for Susan, the one I let her pick was atropine. Uh, don't look now, Mr. Ward, but there's a man behind you. <laughs> Drop that gun. Drop it. Captain McNair. Yeah, with bracelets you can't buy at Tiffany's. You uh, should have looked when I told you, Mr. Ward. Well, sure. Well, Mark, it gets me how you figured this whole thing out. Ah, uh, I'm a dreamer. Uh, would you uh, like to take care of my old hat now? Your old hat? What do you expect me to do with it? We said you were going to eat it, didn't you? Oh, oh yeah. But I said I'd buy a new one first. Well, a deal's a deal, but uh, I hope you won't mind waiting. I uh, know I won't mind. <laughs> And so closes tonight's Crime Club book, Death at 710, based on a story by H.F.S. Moore. Stedman Coles did the radio adaptation. Roger Bauer produced and directed. Raymond Edward Johnson played the part of Mark Kent. Helen Shields was Susan Ward Steele. Cameron Pudon was Captain McNair. Ted Osborne played Gerald Steele. Eleanor Phelps was Claire Ellis. King Calder was Pierce Carlton. And Reese Taylor was heard as Robert Ward. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Yes, come over a week from tonight. Good. We have the very exciting story of a night that was made for fun and remade for murder. It's called Coney Island Nocturne. In the meantime... Well, in the meantime, there's a new crime club book available this week... And every week at bookstores everywhere. Yes, it's available now. Fine. And we'll look for you next week. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.